Okay, let's make a start. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. Welcome to another Nefa Coaches Corner. I can't believe it's been a month since we were last together. Bit of housekeeping before we get on uh, with tonight's webinar, which I'm really, really looking forward to. Um, if you've got any questions as the night goes on tonight, do me a big favour, pop them in the Q&A box and not the chat box. It just makes my life much, much easier. If you do want to share some of your contact details, your LinkedIn address, your Twitter address or anything like that, if you're happy to share those yourselves, please pop that in the chat box, maybe a little bit about where you're from um, as well. I know we're being joined from people from all over, all over the world tonight. So that's absolutely fantastic. We've only had a few of these. So to have that type of reach from all parts of the globe, that's absolutely fantastic. Mm. We've got a really, really busy night tonight. I'm going to hand over to Spencer, who's going to introduce our special guests for this evening. Good evening, Spencer. How are Good you? Good evening, Ryan. Excellent. Good? I, I'm all right. I'm all right. Thank you. I'm all right. So, uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to tonight. Me too as well. So uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, we're joined by David and Keith Mayer this evening, authors of the best selling book, Gold Dust. Keith's had a fantastic career. He currently works at Liverpool Academy and he counts Leeds United, Notts Forest and Wigan Athletic amongst his former clubs. He's also worked for the English and Korean Football Association's in a number of roles. And he also supports a number of different athletes to deliver high performance in their field. Now, David was an apprentice footballer at Wigan Athletic before forging a career in coaching, which has led to him working in the United Kingdom and the United States with clubs such as Manchester City, UNC Charlotte, and he's currently the global head of the foundation phase of the Seven Elite Academy. Now, Keith's joining us from the northern powerhouse of Wigan in the northwest of England. And David, a little more glamorous, joins us from Salt Lake in Utah, the United States. So welcome, gents. Um, before we get into the evening in our normal interactive NEFA format, we always ask our guests to pose a question or two. So what's the first question that we have from David and Keith Ryan? Uh, you know, Spencer, I'm not having it that, that Keith's in Wigan. I know for a fact they don't have the internet in Wigan. I know we, we've only just got it. We've only just got it in Rotherham. So there's no way, there's no way Wigan's got it. So I think sort of location, location unknown on, on, on Keith. But, uh, He's just outside in the posh bit. Just outside, just yeah, in the posh bit, in the posh bit. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, so we've got a couple of questions uh, tonight for you guys uh, from, from David and Keith. But the first question of the night an easy one, a soft one to start with. Um, and it's a simple one. Who's been the best player this season in the Premier League? So I'll launch the little poll here. So have a little vote um, and we will see if there's some consensus. There's, just, there's, quite, there's, quite, a bit of, uh, there's quite a bit of choice uh, there. Um, I resisted putting in some Wolves players, Kevin and Dave, maybe because maybe they've been horrendous. Um, that's probably the principal reason. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll just, um, I'll, uh, I'll let that go for the next 30 seconds or go. It'll also give us a bit more chance for people who are still just dropping onto the webinar as well. So last, uh, last 20 seconds um, or so, uh, you guys have a think as well, um, Spencer, about who you would, who you would choose. Interesting. There seems to be a vote for pretty much everybody there, which is interesting. Okay, last last five seconds. Last five seconds. There's a few of you that haven't voted. So just a few, literally three of you that haven't voted. So now's your chance. Three, two, one. Okay, let's stop that. And I will just share the results uh, here so everybody should see. So it's Gundogan, Gundogan. I mean, what an unbelievable season he is having. So, David, who would you have chosen? Or who do you, who do you choose? Oh, best player in the Premier League for me is De Bruyne. But by, by far, I, think, I don't think there's anybody even close to him. The best player this season, I would somewhat agree with Gundogan. I think he's been very pivotal in City's... I guess, turn of form, because mm. they obviously started a little bit slow, but he's been excellent too. So 
Um, either or, I think Gundogan's contributed with a, a lot of goals in a, in a vital period over Christmas too. Uh, but best player, if we're going best player, I think De Bruyne, I, I think he's the best midfielder in the world. Keith, what, what are your thoughts? Who's been the best player this season for you? Uh, well, I don't think you go too far, too far wrong with Gundogan. However, I don't think anyone can change a game with such laser-guided passes better than Kevin De Bruyne. Yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to go Kevin De Bruyne uh, because of how he changes games in such a dynamic way. Fantastic, excellent. Well, there a nice friendly start to the night. I'm sure we're going to get into the nitty and the gritty from here on in. So, Spencer, I'm going to hand I'm going to hand back to you. Okay. Well, good evening, gents. Welcome. Really appreciate you joining us uh, this evening. So, David, the first question is for you. So, you, you've worked in the UK uh, and you've forged a hugely successful career across the pond in the states. What would you say are the differences in terms of how players have developed over here in the UK? where you are now in the States? Yeah, good question, Spence. Uh, there's a lot of differences. I, I, for me personally, it's it's a great learning lesson, has been and will continue to be. Uh, first and foremost, I think that the main thing is that you're dealing, for the most part, with people who are paying a lot of money for the kid to play football. So the first thing with that is, I think, managing the expectations of parents. I think that's really important. Now, the game in America is young still. Obviously, in England and around Europe and, and in other parts of the world, people have been playing it for years. Where in America, it's young. So you are dealing with, you'll deal with a lot of parents that may have little to no understanding of the game. Um, you do get a lot of the coach parents on the sideline, running up and down, cheering and chanting and screaming and yelling, all kinds of things that you wouldn't believe. Um, like what? Like what? I, oh, I, <laughs> no, give us your worst. Give us your worst. What's the, what's the worst you've heard? What's the worst you've heard? The, the worst I've heard, the worst I've seen yeah. was when a every time the team scored, they picked up a flag and ran. They would run up. They ran the length up and down the, the pitch, screaming and yelling, and everyone's clapping and cheering. And uh, but that that's probably one of the worst I've seen. Uh, you do get you do get the parents telling the players what to do, yeah. Quite a lot of and and some of the some of the things that come out are quite interesting. And and for me, Ryan, I, there's two ways I can look at it. When I first got over it, and I still do to a point, I think, oh, come on, come on, come on, what, what's going on? But for me, I think it's important to understand that those parents are doing the best they can with what they know. And I, I, I've never met a parent, of, I've yet to meet a parent, I'm not saying they don't exist, but I've never met a parent who doesn't want the best for the kids. Yeah. The, the only issue is that some parents don't understand that their behavior is detrimental to the child's development. So my role in that is, is educating parents in my environment. Look, you'll have them in England. They are prevalent over in England too, but I think in the US because of, the nature of the beast and because of how young the game is, I think it's, I think it's, it's a bigger thing. Um, dealing with it is a different situation. And in England, I mean, Spence, I'm sure you can attest to this. And, and I know my dad, dad as well in academies in England, it's a much easier solution. If you have a parent that is a constant disruption, the club can straighten them up by saying, if you carry on, we will be letting your kid go because your behavior is affecting not only your child, but other parents in the group. Um, over here, it's not that simple. And you um, mentioned uh, as well, David, the, the obviously pain, you know, for the for the football or soccer, as they yeah. uh, strangely call it over there. Yeah. I mean, what kind of money they pay? I've heard things before. It's a good few thousand dollars a year, isn't it, that they, they invest in? Oh yeah, oh yeah, fifteen hundred. I've heard some teams will pay up to eight thousand wow. a year. So you'll have a range, but you unlikely unlikely to find places that are less than a thousand but the average i'd say between fifteen hundred and three thousand dollars a year and that bear in mind spence that doesn't include any sort of tournament travel fees etc so when you when you factor those things in as well you you're talking upwards of five grand for one kid now and in utah it's and it is part of the the religion 
is that they have a lot of kids. So they they want to replenish the earth. So some of them have got 10, 10 15 children, uh, which you'd need. Okay. You, you need those 10, 15 children to get their own jobs to pay for. Wow. For the game. You um, get plenty of overtime in to pay for that. Right. Oh, I know. 24 hour day, day jobs. But it it is, like I said, over here, it, it's a business. Clubs want your money. But for me, I think there has to be a, a balance between taking money and setting rules and standards for players and parents. Because in, in my my opinion, some things can't be compromised on. So I'm here to develop your child as a player and as a person. But if you won't give me the best opportunity and our club the best opportunity to do so, there are other clubs who can fit your ideals. There are other clubs that will take your money and will let you scream and shout on the sideline. I'll be a disruption. That's fine. There's lots of options. But for me, you've got to do what's best. And um, I think as well as that, it, it's a... Generally speaking, it's a middle-class sport in America. Uh, you don't, I think the dynamic of the, the areas, you don't really see kids outside on their own or with friends kicking a ball about. I've, I've yet to see that. Now, part of that might be because they live so far away from each other. Um, and I think because of that, it changes. I had, I had an idea when I first came over here, Spence, that, we had to do lots of 1v1s, 2v1s, 3v2s, competition-based stuff at younger ages and build it up from there. And the longer I was here, I started to rethink it a little bit is when you're dealing with the majority of kids who probably never run around or touch a ball outside of practice time, I had to then get the balance between having fundamental movements, unopposed technical work that would challenge them, and then fitting in um, small sided competition. And that's been, that's been a learning. And, and for me, I think the other one, which is, is a massive thing over here is the element of competition. Uh, it throws a massive curveball in because for some parents, every single game, whether they are eight or 18 is the world cup final. Yeah. And, and it's a cultural thing from, from other sports in, in America is the American culture is more so win at all costs. And I've seen it firsthand that if you don't win, some parents deem that the child's development is a failure. If they aren't winning, they're not developing. Now, winning is important, no question. But I ask the question, is it about right now and your eight-year-old son who still can't tie his shoelaces winning a game? Or is it about developing him to be a success in 5, 10, 15 years' time? Uh, and... I think my, the, the last thing, so there's a, there's a brilliant video. I actually watched it. I actually reshared it on Facebook yesterday. Um, it's one that I saw three years ago. So there's a, a coach called Frank Martin, yeah. who's University of South Carolina men's basketball coach. And it, it's one of my favorite videos. And I'd be, if anybody wants it, I'd be happy to share it with people if they want to connect with me afterwards. But it's something that really epitomizes some of the struggles that you will go through. But again, I, like I said, it's a great learning lesson for me because I'm not just dealing with the game. It's not just a ball. I have to learn how to deal with other aspects of the game that have just as big, if not a bigger impact on the development of the people that I'm working with. Yeah, no, it's good. Uh, the, the Frank Martin uh, video, it's when I used to do some work for the FA, the coach education, I showed it on every course. It's very powerful, isn't it? And uh, I think it's uh, for the audience tonight, you know, look it up. Um, it's worth having a watch at. Well, thanks for that, David. Um, Keith, so a question for you, sir. So uh, we both uh, have a favourite quote, um, which is coming on screen now. There we go. So uh, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Uh, and something which is uh, early on in the, the book, Gold Dust. Why has this quote had such an impact on you, Keith? What a great question. The I came across this, Spence, just over a decade ago. David, over in the States, he then sent it to me. And I resonated with this immensely, based upon really how I was feeling at the time. I'm missing my son. 
I've got my, uh, I've got, you know, two thirds of the family uh, back home and one of them, one of the, the, uh, the other part of it is over in the States or a quarter of the family, should I say, is, is over in the States. So what we had is this, when, you, when we do things, we will tend to forget things. So if we reflect back to school and we remember a good teacher, a good mentor or a good uh, coach that we actually come across, this, this is very prevalent. So we'll forget what they tell us. We'll even forget what they did or we'll forget what we did. But the one thing that we'll never do is we'll, we'll never forget how people make us feel, whether that be either positive or negative. So in relation to, how do we relate that to the game of football? Well, every time that we go out and coach, then players want to be, they want to be scraping the claws, they want to be running in, and they want to be dragging, the parents want to be dragging the feet and scraping the claws on the deck on the way out. So where it comes down to the, uh, the feeling, because it is, it's an experiential, the game is about, an experience and the experience that we want to leave players athletes is one of one of positivity and one of having a nice feeling because the more and more that we feel good about certain things the easier and i use the word easier the easier it is for them to learn so when they're in when we enjoy things we're actually allowing ourselves the permission to for things to happen so I, I really, when David shared it with me, as I say, over 10 years ago, I use it on every single quote. Now I use it on every single email that I send. It's at the base of my, my emails. And it's based upon that, that feeling, you know, where we get a touchy feeling about the game itself. And I'm sure everybody that's listening to what I've just shared will resonate with it. It's, we'll all remember a good teacher, a good coach, uh, and equally, we'll also remember the opposite to that. And it's, it's the in-between, you know, how do we move from, you know, good feelings or how can we transfer and help players so that they're enjoying the game at a level where they want to be coming back to us. So they're enjoying the experience right from the start, from when they come on in, to every single last second to when they depart. Uh, yeah, so, so just just to come in there, Keith. I just you know realised that you know we were just sharing some stories about a mutual coaching friend in in, in Tosh Farrell, and I think you know we were talking. We weren't really talking about Tosh's sort of technical ability as a coach or anything like that. It's you know his enthusiasm and like how he makes you chuckle, how he's always got a story. And if somebody said to me, Ryan, coach uh, Tosh is going to do a, a session over there. Do you want to go over and do it? I'd I'd be like, yeah, definitely, because of exactly what you what what you're saying. You know, his enthusiasm and how that made me feel. Um, yeah. And 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 I I, comp I completely agree. And I think you know all of us in football have have seen the opposite about that, where somebody didn't really seem like they want to be there, or it's a bit of a struggle or whatever. Yeah. And it and it's and it's hard and it's hard to make you, you take some extra determination then to make you feel differently. Sure, sure. Uh, no, great, great stuff, great stuff. Um, so we're going to take our first uh, question now. I'm just going to stop this share very, very quickly so you can all see a bigger version of us, which I'm sure is, is delightful for everybody. Um, and then we're going to bring in Ben. Let me see, uh, Ben. Here we go. Um, Ben, can you can you hear us? Ryan, you've just you've just got me in time there. Well, you, you know, you say that I I call that seamless. You 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 call it. You call it. You, 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 call it, you call it whatever you like. I call it seamless. Um, I've been running around trying to fix it. I've got it on my hotspot now. Oh, good, good. Good man, Ben. Thanks for your life story, Ben. Now your question. <laughs> Rude as ever, right? <laughs> Yeah, um, so again, probably leading on from the last one in, t in terms of your book, um, you refer to a Vince Lombardi quote about knowing yourself. Um, and can you tell us some, some, some of like, why you feel it's important that, that you understand yourself to become an effective leader? Yeah, um, good question, Ben. For me, I think it's really, really important that you know your your personal values and your beliefs, uh, what your purpose is really. So, 
when you think about what is important to you and, and why it's important, if if something means something to you, it has the emotional power to shape your behavior. Um, so there's a there's actually a quote from the co-founder of Walt Disney. Uh, so a guy's called Roy Disney. Um, and he said the following. He said, when your values are clear to you, making decisions becomes easier. And I, I really resonate with that. I really believe it. I'm a, I'm a person of, of principles and quite strong principles. And even though I'm flexible within what I do and the situations, my principles, they don't get compromised. Uh, and knowing what I stand for makes decisions that involve my values and beliefs easier. And I know we'll move on to something related to this shortly, but the values and beliefs can come from, from so many different things, whether it be your upbringing, your past experiences, your social circles. And for me personally, I was really fortunate with my upbringing. So obviously my dad is on the call and he played the biggest part in it. Um, but my, my granddad uh, my granddad's a, he's, he's probably the, the greatest person I've ever met. Now he, he's so, so set in his ways. He's so set in his views and it has its pros and cons. But the one thing he has is old school, solid beliefs and values. So for him, I, you say to him, granddad, be at my house at 830 in the morning, he'll turn up. He'd be there. He'd be there at seven thirty, seven forty-five, waiting. Early. No yeah, one, yeah. no one's out of bed yet. Yeah. And um, for him, being honest is the only way to operate. There's no other way than honesty. And he'll give it to you. He'll just get you right between the eyes with something. And those kind of things have, for me, of something that have been passed down, uh, but they've been adjusted and adapted to to suit my my needs and. I, I think so having values and beliefs, it, it's not about having fancy words and slogans up at your training facility or in your offices. It's truly just about knowing what you stand for and being true to it. Because I don't think you, you say something and become it. Uh, you do it and become it. And I'm, I'm mindful of time, but I, I've over the past few months, I've been doing research on emotional intelligence and the importance of it. And this is since the book came out, it's preceded it of just having the ability to understand and manage your own emotions and that of the people around you, because you can have your values and beliefs, but if you don't know how to manage your emotions, it's, it can go wayward very quickly. And again, it's that there are five key elements that I've looked at in emotional intelligence from a guy, a guy called Dan Goldman who first really uncovered this and they are so that the five elements are self-awareness. So being aware and having the ability to, to understand and recognize your personal moods. So if I'm in a bad mood, I can, I, I have the awareness to recognize it. Uh, Self-regulation, which is the ability then, you know what your, your mood is, you know how your emotions are, but you can regulate it. You have the ability to speak, to, to suspend judgment and think before acting because we know all too well that if somebody's in a bad mood and they can't regulate it they'll generally start firing off at people and it, it doesn't go too well and then the other three internal motivation uh, empathy which we'll touch on we touched on very very heavily in our book which involves caring for people and then having social skills and it's something again I, I'm happy to go into more detail at another point I'm mindful of time but I, I am happy to speak to people about that. So I hope that answers the question, Ben. Yeah, no, absolutely. Just, just, just following on from that, do, do, you, do you reflect on some of the key, the key values that you have and that you stand by and, and sort of measure them against, against your coaching and against your management of people? Yes, I do. I do. Um, I... Oh, I I'm very strong around those things. So for me, uh, honesty and respect are two things that are really, really high up for me. So I'll, I'll be honest with you and I'll be respectful. 
So in my environment, I'm respectful to everybody that walks through that front door, every single person, anyone I speak to, I want, because that I think that's the way it should be. Now for the young boys and girls that I work with, I think they need to be respectful too. And I, I also, I do think that it can be a little bit soft nowadays where people get away with too much. And it's not about me coming in with my military hat on and screaming and shouting because that's not how I do it. But I do ensure that those, those things that I hold close to me, I ensure that in my environment, I keep them. And, um, and I want the people that are, that are within that environment to be the same. So my players, I want them to be respectful of each other. I want them to be respectful of me, of the ref, of the opposition. So a quick example, if, if I hear a kid arguing with the referee at 13 years of age, they're not going to have the referee to deal with. That'll be, that'll be me that they deal with because I've made it clear prior to that that's not how we do things. Let me... Uh, so, Ben, I mean, I could ask you what you value. I, I think it's a great question you pose. I think you live... David's already mentioned it. You live your values. It's, we have something that we're anchored to. There are specific values like David's alluded to. My dad, David's granddad, time, punctuality. You don't need to think about it. It lives by it day in, day out. And so when you self-regulate though, I don't think that is a, there are certain things that might come on your radar that could possibly. So you, you, get, you go, well, I now need to start to value, which we have now got in, uh, which is very prevalent, is the Black Lives Matter what do I value about it? I don't know where I sit with it overall because I'm trying to put it into context, but I value what's taking place. I don't know at the moment. I don't think many people do know how we can resolve the issue. I value what's taking place. I know specifically how my, my true value is how people need to be treated. So I think we're, we're anchored to those. They won't change. That will never change for, 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 for us, for a super question. Thank you, Ben. It's Ryan, great stuff. Cheers. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Uh, okay, yeah, we're going to move on to the next question, uh, which is from Ashley. So I'm just going to bring Ash on. Ash, can you hear us? I can. Evening. E evening, Ash. Yes. How are you? All right, you all okay? Good, yeah. Hi, good. Ash. Hi, Hi Ash. Uh, after you've started to build your connections with players, uh, what would you say is that players want to know about their coach? Is that to me, Ash, or to David? Either one, any one of you can pick it up. Go on, I'll pick that one up then, David. So, I think in context, there's context and content. Context and content. In context, the players require that we, we care for them as you probably already know, is it's so easy to build a connection or it can be easy to, uh, to build a connection, but it's, it's very, very easy to lose it. So we don't, we don't have to, if you don't have people enjoying their experience, that connection will be lost very, very quickly. So like many things, if we, we don't water a plant, it withers and dies over time. So what we need to do is check in on what's important and we need to revisit what made the relationship form in the in the first place so we players need to know that we care for them that that that's important because what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to stretch the thinking we're going to nurture their hope we're going to help to nurture a dream within them uh, which is an incredible privilege on the on the facility on the coaches uh, point of view but for that to happen we need to actually build trust. So players want to know that we care for them. They want to know that we trust them and that comes in time. And they also want to know that we can help them. Once we've got that, we, we then start to, we're, we're moving along. Uh, because ultimately what we're intending to do is we, we intend to stretch and extend the ropes beyond where they currently are and to be it to be able to do that we've got to we've got to take them beyond all all expectations so 
sometimes the athletes don't know where it is they, they want to be going. They're just coming on a journey. And for us to, to build the trust, the care and the helping process, which is, which is important, we then got to look at the content. So the previous three, the, 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 the care, the help and the trust is the context. The content, there are more, but I'm going to stick with three primarily for players, is they want all players, everybody that's played on this call and may continue to play, they may continue, they may still be playing, that they want bags of touches, bags of touches in every practice. They also want to have plenty shots. So we're finishing. I want to experience shooting. I want to experience on the flip of that, if you're shooting, can I actually have some defending going on? So you're actually providing a need beyond that. And of course, what they need is plenty of games. So really the, 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 uh, the, the building of the connection, Ash is, is down to the, do you care? Do you trust me? Or can they trust you? Because it's not about us trusting them. It might sound a little different, us trusting them. It's them trusting us. If we can get both, then we're on a winner. Because for sure, you know, the end goal is to, is to take them and transfer them from where they are and help them, help the players to become better at doing what it is they do. And if we can do that, and that's our aim. Now is the task. What do you think? No, I think that's brilliant. I think obviously touch on the trust bit. They're actually trusting us to help them develop. Um, sure. and I think you wouldn't be a coach if you didn't want to help develop players. So sure. they're you can put, draw on your past experience and everything like that. But ultimately, it's building that rapport to start with, and them then how quickly can they do it? And then is it reciprocal? It's great. Yeah. How do you do it, Ash? Getting to know them. I, th I think it's just being a, a genuine person. Uh, don't just ask them about the football. It might be how the day has been and things like that. And and taking a little bit of time and finding out the person. Because, uh, again, I think ultimately what we do, we're developing a, the person, not the player, really. Yes. Mm. Yeah, Keith, just, sure just, just, just to follow that on from Ash, do, do you think that's getting harder? And I say that to you as well, Dave, Dave as well, and, and you, Ash, do, do you think that's getting harder? I think we all look back to our childhood and we see, we see the sort of modern incarnation of the young person as somebody sort of different to how, to how we were. So, Keith, do you think that it's, it's more of a challenge getting to that point now than what it was 20 years ago? Or? Yeah, I, I've, been, I've been involved in the game. We're very fortunate to be involved in the game in less than four decades, just under four decades now, and without doubt. I think the biggest thing that I've had to do, Ryan, is I've learned specifics. I've been shown and been very fortunate to be around some, ex, some exemplars that I believe were exemplars in, the, in their art. They were uh, mavericks of the kind but it was a method of delivery where you were told what to do. And so I, I adopted that. I adapted it then to meet what I felt was right. And then as you, as you go along, players, the individuals change. We've now, got, we've now got to understand a little, have a greater understanding really of, you know, sort of child development. That's quite an in-depth topic in itself, but it's just culturally massively different. There are parameters and rules in which we got to stick by. So again, without a rule, we're going to have chaos. I think nowadays, if you, David mentioned it earlier, we, we have, if you're involved in an academy, you, we've got an element of strength behind the badge can actually, we can, we can make things uh, less comfortable for a parent that's creating an havoc or creating issues. It's even more difficult though now for, for academies to offload those because we're, we're obligated. We've got these contracts and it's a softer, we are softer with it. And I believe it's right, by the way, where you've got the iron fist. We, we, need to be, we need to look at things from 360, different perspective, looking at it from their point of view, looking at it from our point of view, looking at it from if you like an, elegant, uh, uh, an overview of impartiality. 
players are massively different. And in terms of trying to get depth from them, because there's so much going on, they've got the internet, they've got, they're no longer playing on the streets. We need to adjust, we need to adjust and adapt to meet that need. To our players or players that are, uh, that are now involved in the game, they, they don't know every player that plays in Europe or because they're playing, they're playing online, aren't they? They've got, they've got FIFA games, they've got everything. They, they, they know. So getting to know them is, is quite, uh, and I know we'll go into that a little bit later, but asking questions like Ash mentioned there, getting to know what, what should, do you have a dog? Do you have a, do you have a, a brother or a sister? Do you like music? I had a player, a young lad, were super, super talent. And, uh, you know, I'm asking him at practice because my my actual office is walking from, from the academy building up to the pitches. That's my office space, that, walking from where they, where they're coming in and walking up to the pitch with a player or two, just finding out what's taking place and uh, what's going on during the day. And one lad in particular, I just asked him about, you know, what have you done today? History, loves his history. And I, and I wasn't the best in school. And uh, I just asked him about what he'd been doing. He'd been doing something about Henry VIII. And I, I just asked him the question, well, I don't know that. And it was me being real. Uh, look, I genuinely don't know anything about history. And an adult talking to a youngster in such a way, I don't know whether it appeased it, softened it somewhat where he, uh, I asked him, could you bring, could you write something down for me and bring it in next training session of which he did. He, ta he, uh, he photocopied it, but he highlighted all the points. Now, that's one thing. So all I've done is collect data collection. That's all it is at this point. It's then what you do with it. And that really is where the magic lies because you can collect information or listen to questions or ask questions, but that doesn't, that's not where your magic lies. The magic lies in, in listening to the response and then taking action thereafter. I think that's really important, Keith, and uh, something we do at NEFRA as part of the process for the induction of a, a getting to know you form. And it asks all, all sorts of things, favourite subjects at school. You know, I did when I was at Sheffield Wednesday, one of the boys uh, you know, loves Spanish. My Spanish is very poor, but I attempted a few times. And I think it's about building those connections, isn't it? And I think you mentioned, you know, will people help you? Will there be trust there and a level of care? And I think it's so important to really get to know the people aside or away from training um, and build that. And that's something we've done at NEFA. I would say the last year, haven't we, Ryan? All of our players, uh, we have a really in-depth understanding of them or as much as we can uh, before we actually yeah, yeah. get on the grass. Uh, and that's really served as well. Mm. I, I'm just going to jump in as well because Ash mentioned a word that I liked in he said being genuine mm. and I, I think people will suss you out if you're not they'll they'll figure you out because if if you are if you follow if you follow BS they'll just they'll know and I think being genuine and being authentic to who you are is is very important and the how to build relationships and connections is a skill you don't just get born and you're just suddenly able to build relationships with people some people will be better than others but it's something that can be learned it's something that you can you can adjust and adapt and you can pick up from from other people i know so from i'll be honest when i when i first started coaching and i think most people are in the same boat i had no idea absolutely no idea what i was doing all i did was I just copied what my dad was doing because I used to watch him. Everywhere he went, I'd just watch. And I had the same mannerisms and I had no idea. I didn't know why I was doing it, but then obviously you get a better understanding and, and I learned in my own way, my own unique way of how to do it. And, and the other thing as well in there is, is the trust bit that was touched upon it's something that probably takes more time than anything else to build up to truly trust somebody takes, takes time. And you've got to do what you say. I, I've had personal experiences and, and I've seen it where if you tell me, and I, I know for a fact, if I went in and said, lads, the result doesn't matter this weekend, not a problem. If we then go get beat three nil and I'm, I'm hammering them after the game, I've lost them. 
because I've not done what I've said. So being consistent in your messages and consistent with what you say and what you do, they'll, they'll help over time with that. Yeah, I, th- I think it's a really interesting point. And, and for me, you know, you see a lot in certainly in some English, but there's a fear about being genuine. Um, and I think at certain times that manifests itself, you know, around this time, a lot of boys will get, will get released from clubs and yeah, well, you know, or why did you get re- released? And, you know, some of the reasons I wouldn't say are, are, are genuine, are genuine reasons, you know, about we have this sort of fear of being genuine, this fear of, you know, sometimes genuine for me is, look, this is going to, what I'm about to tell you is going to be upsetting, but it's also the truth. It's also the truth. Um, so I think, look, I think it's a really, really interesting set of points. Ash, thanks for your contribution there. Thank you, Ash. Thank, Thank you, Ash. Ash. Uh, we're just going to get one more question in before we um, have a, a break, and uh, it is from Adam Clark. Hey, good evening, Adam. Hello. Hi, Hi Adam. How, how are you? Good. Hi, Adam. Mate, you good? Hi, right, Adam. Right, guys, you good? Yeah, good. Yeah, good got a question, you. Adam? Yeah, just following on there from Ash's um, question. So that once the connections have been built with the coach and the, and the player, it's just what other... Um, relationships could you have and what ones are key and why really within within the football environment yeah good question Uh, I'll go back because I answered I can relate it back to somewhat of my first question is at youth level parents play a big part in the child's development they're a huge huge stakeholder in the process and I think being clear with parents is important and like I said earlier I've never met a parent who didn't want the best for the kids so I think having the parents involved and giving them an understanding of what's taking place is important uh, besides that so so in our book Adam we talk about silent whispers so when we, we talk about connections and, and other people that can have an influence I think understanding what a player or a person's challenge points are, what the strengths strengths and weaknesses are, and and then knowing if there's a third party that is in a better position than I am to influence that player. Um, and and so one of the one of the greatest managers ever, probably the greatest manager ever, um, Sir Alex Ferguson, he actually alluded himself to bringing in the right people into players' lives at the right time, and it's an art. That's something that. Again, over time, you, you learn and having that that skill set as a coach to understand what is right at the right time. So whether it be another coach that you're working with, whether it be a teammate, because you know that that teammate has a great relationship with a certain player or, or another influence in the players' lives. Because I think as coaches, we have to sometimes let go of our own ego and understand that we're probably not in the best position in that moment to help somebody. And I had an, I actually had an experience this past fall um, in during our season. So I had a, a, a Hispanic player in the team. He spoke, he was fluent English, but from Mexico. And I had a good relationship with the kid, but there were points where I, I was, there was one game in particular, I was actually struggling to get through to him. And I, I had two routes that I could have gone. The first one could have been, well, there was three. The first one was scream and shout on the sideline. Uh, The second one was just take him off. And then I thought, you know what? It is what I'm going to do. Now, this particular boy, he had an influence in his life that was at the game. He was also Hispanic and he was much, much closer to the player than I was. And he was also his coach at another team. So this kid played on two teams and he was his coach and I knew this guy. So I actually used this other guy as an influence to positively, well, what I was hoping would positively impact the player. So I actually spoke to the, to the guy, told him what I needed, what was going on. And he got the message across for me because for me, it it wasn't working and I could keep pushing water up a downspout or I can try something new. Now, the best way to, to, to monitor success is to see if there was a change in behavior afterwards. And, and luckily in that moment, there was, there was a change in behavior positively. It's not to say that it would always work. Um, but 
that that for me was a a good a good learning lesson that there are other people that can influence better than I can. Um, but like I said, there's you've got parents. It could be another coach. It could be a teammate. It could be a guardian that you can use to help influence and help develop the, the player that you're working with. What you also have here is it's knowing who you are. So it's knowing who you are as a coach. David's mentioned this. Uh, but there are there's something called the, the requisite uh, law of requisite law of variety. And so what that means is the, the widest available options available to you in any man, machine, or any system will control that system. So having 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 have having had lots of experiences in around this arena, uh, like I'm sure many of you on the call has done as well, is sometimes you just got to let go. You've just got to let go. And David mentioned those three options that he, that he shared with, which are very important as a coach to recognize that and recognize it early. Otherwise, we might be losing a player or two. So we, we, we got attrition in the game as it is. But it's been mindful of that. Um, brilliant. Adam, did you want to come back quickly on any of those points? No, I think it's um, good what the what the guy said. And in regards to that is obviously maybe having an open door policy to some degree um, with parents. I know parents is widely spoken here within this context, but obviously in other contexts, you could also, I guess, have rela relationships with fans to a degree, depending on the size of the club or the same stakeholders. Obviously, you've got your board or committee as well, which obviously are vitally important depending on the level so using the using the, the youth as a example there work but obviously there's other ways you could look at it i guess as well but it was just more to see what relationships to, you could you could add there and add some meat to the bone yeah fantastic great thanks question. adam thanks, thanks you, adam great, great question right. thanks adam thanks adam um, okay, we are going to have a small break now, Just, but before we do, um, I'm just going to share the screen again and I'm going to introduce the second question of the evening from Keith and David. Um, and so the question uh, again is, um, what helps shape your values? Um, so what we want you to do during the break, we're going to have a five minute break. So it's about 19 minutes past now. So we'll come back at about 24 minutes uh, past past eight in that time just jot down in the chat box for me what helps shape your values not what are your values but what helps shape them okay so bit of a comfort break now cup of tea cup of coffee whatever you, whatever you like um i'm not sure what the the tipple is in in utah david um you'll have to come back and show us in a minute uh, but we'll see everybody we'll see everybody uh, back here in five minutes time Hello, everybody. I um, hope everybody's uh, able to have a, a quick break there. Um, we want to get back into it now. So, yes, just prior to the break, we asked the question. Well, Keith and David asked you the question. What helps shape your values? So thanks for all the responses. I'll just pull uh, a couple out. Um, Scott, Scott says, what shapes my values, my upbringing, my life and my football experiences, the people I work and coach with, the players I coach, the behaviours that are important to me. That sounds a fantastic answer. Mike has to be, uh, says, uh, has to be my own children and the type of confident and driven individuals I want them to grow and become. Great one. Uh, Liam says, everyday experiences, work, family, social life. Uh, Stephen says, my values are shaped constantly by my sporting client challenges in my role as their mind fitness coach. That sounds interesting. Uh, ben says environment, family, personal relationships, work and social, life experiences. So some, uh, you know, a sort of really, really good list there. Uh, Graham, here's another one. My club and its ethos, fellow coaches, my football experiences, my life experiences. And finally, Jeff, family experiences, worldviews and faith, which is a great one um, as, as, as well. Um, Keith, gonna throw the gonna throw the question back at you. Um, you know, just uh, before you do, Ray. Yep. This is just while we're on about it. That that's gonna tie in. As soon as he asks what I'm drinking, yep. 
And what's going to tie into what come next comes next? I know what's coming next, but everybody else is thinking, "Whoa, where's this? this? Where's this going? Where's <laughs> this throwing going? one out there?" <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, Keith, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thank you, Ray. And I don't know whether you can see my mug. I don't know whether. Yeah, whether got it. Yeah. Seen. So, so, in uh, on the nineteenth of December two thousand and four. Uh, a little fella came into my life, a little dog, little West Island Terrier on the 21st of December. We had to, he's 16 years of age, uh, we had to have him put down. Now, oh, we don't want to put a dampener on it, but so what? So what? What did he do? Well, go on, right, you just... Yeah, sure. Just... So I, Jack taught us many, many, taught my family, taught my, uh, my kids so, so much. And for those that have got dogs or got animals, what can be taught from them? They, do they do things overtly? Do they do things covertly? But without a shadow of a doubt, what we have are the core values that are near and dear. And this is what we, this is what Jack taught us. Thanks, Ray. If you, uh, yeah, thank you. So in terms of football, or in terms of the word sincerity, Jack in himself was very, he knew he was, he knew what he was about and everything that he did was absolutely sincere to 100% from inside, outside, every single sinew of his body, we, he was sincere. If he wanted a chew stick, He's having a chew stick. And for those that have got dogs, they'll glare you in the eye. They'll eyeball you. And uh, they're, they're having something. They know what is required and they're coming for it. And he did right. get them, by the way. <laughs> and he, well, David said he was the boss. I definitely disagree with it. I would only give him a chew stick when I decided to, which is pretty <laughs> much every time. Yeah. <laughs> Go on, right. Yeah. The other thing that I had was, now there's a couple of things here, and it, the word keeps coming up, honesty. And I think we can be brutally honest, brutal honesty and pure honesty. So, for example, you can have a player and the parent comes and asks a question, how is my son or daughter doing? And you tell them, well, they're absolutely, well, they're not very good, and we're going to get rid of them, and they're useless. That's brutal honesty. I think we need to be, and, and I'm sure we'll agree with it, is it also pure honesty where you can still tell the truth, but it's how you go about doing it through language, through how we covertly or pre-frame certain things like, uh, what do you think? Could be throwing it back to them, but Jack was honest. He was as honest as the days long. He knew exactly what, what was required. And then of course, the last thing which Ryan will share with us now is he was authentic. He wasn't an elephant, he wasn't a giraffe, uh, he wasn't a snake or a mouse or a cat. He was, he was who he is. He didn't perhaps know, know he was a dog, by the way. He just was living who he was. And I, I throw it out there. Do you really know? The reason why I asked the question is we've asked what else shape your values, which thank you for those that have replied. However, thanks, Ray. What are your values? And do you live them? Are they sincere or honest? And they're only words. I don't believe we need to. You live your values. There are some that you'll be anchored to and will live by them. And you don't need anything to change them. That will be who you are. But we, we can reevaluate re certain values. And I'm sure... Uh, Spence, you're very high up on this as well, aren't you, in terms of what you value and how you go about shaping your business and how you uh, how you operate in a right. And same with you, in actual fact, Ryan. Yeah, I think absolutely, Keith, and um, two of the values David mentioned a little earlier are respect and honesty uh, in our core values. And I think for me as well, it's, uh, you know, your why, you know, so uh, me working in education and, you know, working um with adolescents predominantly, it's creating brighter futures for them. And that's what NEF is about. And that's what the education company is about as well. I think having that, that purpose, your why, you know, why you get out of bed in the morning, it is very important. And your values are intertwined within that. 
you, you, you know, you know, so, sorry, sorry. Jess, I, I, I was just sorry, saying, I, I just think you, you, you get on a really interesting point here that I haven't really heard discussed before about in terms of, you know, your, your values. So you're talking about the examples there of um, sincerity and, and, and honesty, but there's different ways for your values to be manifested. You know, it's only this year, you know, Spencer introduced me to the to the work of, of, of Carol Dweck and, and, and a growth mindset. And it's completely changed my change of mind of, of approach of how I'm honest with people. And, you know, and we do it like with our players now. So if they're not capable of doing something or they're not a very good player, like you've spoke about there, well, you can't do this yet. Rather than you can't do it, you're not going to do it. You're not able to do it yet. But, in, you know, just, just changing that one word changes the whole aspect of the sentence you're saying and the delivery of the value that you're that you're trying to put across in honesty as well sure um so i think i think it's such an interesting point that you're saying about it, it's one thing having your values and then the delivery mechanism of them is 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 something is something separate i think it's a really interesting idea i think when we have a, a list of values and it's it's this is a we could we could do a a webinar just on values and values mm -hmm. alone however when you write down what you believe to be uh, your true values what you live by and then prioritizing your values or re you can then look at where you spend most of your time or where you must spend most of your time for you to live your value so for example and it's it's not done we we don't do it we don't do it as as frequent as we ought to we'll go and employ someone or we take somebody on board and people will be the when you when you actually write down their values as risk might be high up on the hierarchy of values and then you get somebody who likes security you're going to get a polarity response so it's 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 a big it's a big subject it's a huge subject something that we you know what when we actually came around to to putting the book together we just we, we put these values down and here we are but our job our dog jack uh he certainly helped to uh to shape us as well without a shadow of a doubt i think something david said a little earlier as well keith is you know the values and i think you referred to words on the wall david uh, and you see this you can go around all the academies and this is our mission these are our values but the key is living them and um, you know, working the academy system, the group I, I looked after, and indeed what we have at NEFA, we have three core values. And we remind the players, you know, I'll say every day, but every few days, these are our values. You know, this is how we live at NEFA. Uh, and I think it's important for us as, you know, adults, knock, some of us are knocking on a bit more than others, be a little older than Ryan, for example, but it is to teach them what values are uh, and why they're important. And I think that's a great piece of work that we can do uh, with the young kids that we're working. Yeah, there's there's loads to talk. I've got about a thousand questions just on that one, but I'm gonna I'm gonna refrain. I'm gonna refrain, and I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna move on because I know uh, Liam uh, has, has has got a question, so I'm gonna bring Liam in. Liam, can you hear us? Good evening. Yeah, I can hear you. Hi, Liam. Hi, Liam. How are you? Hi, Hi Liam. Liam. Yeah, I'm well. Um, my question is for Keith. So, in the Gold Dust book, David and yourself talk about reframing. Could you give some insight into what this is and the benefits of the technique, please? Hmm. Yeah, sure. So, in essence, when we so reframing, if we when we change what we think, when we change what we think, it changes how we feel, and so the, therefore, it changes what we can do. So the, ir the ir irony of things at times is we can get stuck. Players, for example, can get stuck in being, or coaches get stuck in, in actually doing a certain thing that actually doesn't operate or operate efficiently or effectively. So how do we go about doing that? So really reframing is only, it's only seeing a current situation from a different perspective. That's all it is, which can really tremendously help. It can be tremendously helpful in solving decision making, it can it can help problem solving, it can also help in learning. So really what we're doing is we're shifting a player's, what it means to a player uh, and shaping them from one, one actual action and helping them make a more empowered act. So how do we do that or what can be done? Uh, an example might be you have a player that 
is striking it. They say, I can't do certain things. I can't do it. And many on the call will be saying, I can't do it. And they've heard it so many times. You might see it in an action, but actually asking the players, I can't do it. Then they'll tell you that. So it's moving them from I can't to possibly maybe to I can. So how, how do we do? And uh, if you have a, a, a young player that's got, he's hitting it with his, he's striking it with his right. You play a ball to his left hand side and he says, I can. So how do we go about helping them to get from I can't to maybe to I can? And it would be, have you ever done, have you ever struck a ball with your left side in the past? Yes. So all we're aiming to do is get something called yeses. Okay, so you've been able to do certain thing. Yeah. Okay. Now all we do is, can you have that success again? All you do is you either move them closer so that they actually have the success. So they're striking it with the left foot and then they go and, they go and strike it with the left foot and there's an element of success. Now, of course, the, the fluency of how they go about striking the ball might be different to the, when they're striking it with the other foot, the, the one where they're very competent with. But really all we're doing is moving them and shaping through language and allowing them the opportunity to break a pattern of behavior. So really that's all it is, it's a process. So the process of, uh, or a strategy, and it's, when I say relatively simple, if we accept that they can't do things, then that's exactly what becomes the behavior. They can't do it. So, uh, so Spence, let me ask you a question. Let, let me ask you a question. If there's something that you know you can't do, and you know you can't do it, what might that be? Um, I, I know one thing I can't do at the moment, Keith, is kick with my left foot. That is, uh, yeah, something I've noticed the last week at training. So I've got a bit of an injury on the right foot, Keith, and it's been very embarrassing. <laughs> I'm absolutely okay. hopeless with my left foot. You're hopeless with your left foot. Okay, so I'm not there yet, to use one of Carol Dweck's uh, words. <laughs> so if there's some information that I can help you with, if I've got something that can help you become even better, would you be interested in finding out what that might be? Absolutely. Okay. So what is it that we need to do then to help you with your right, with your left foot? A lot of work, maybe technique. Okay. What maybe, maybe you know? changing my mindset as to why I don't use my left foot. Okay. So what specifically is it that needs to be done for us to do that? To get a belief, to have the belief that I can use my left foot. Okay. Have you ever had success in the past with things that you've not been able to do? I've actually scored a goal with my left foot before, Keith. Oh, good. Just tell me about it's that. a long time ago. Tell, tell me about that time. Well, it was more my shin. <laughs> <laughs> right. But no, no, I did score one with my left foot many years ago. It was so actually unique that I remembered it. So you were, so you were, so you were successful. Yeah. Good. How did it make you feel? Brilliant. Okay. So all, all we now do is we'll, we'll get a ball, we move closer and so that there is success. So you, you so if we had to do this practically, all I'd be doing is just taking you so you can't miss. Yeah. So we're going from, you can't all through asking specific questions and eliciting responses or eliciting uh, a response and then listening specifically and then going into an action because it's the action really which is which is going to embed and the, the the closer you get to the action and the quicker you can get success without dwelling on too much chit chat because all I would basically do if you're working with players and it's lashing down because it will think about the weather we're going to think about the environment and the number of players that might be standing and stopping around, all I would do is just get a ball and just throw it onto your left-hand side or roll it and get you so you can strike it. We, we have players that are like that now. We don't ask many questions. We just get them so that they strike, they're striking the ball. So, 
so reframing uh, information is is only opening up another portal of opportunity where you where, where we're breaking a pattern of behavior and then replacing it with something of greater good for them to then experience a, a positive action so it's not impossible to miss a goal right in front of them and and so we can gear them up for failure or we can gear them up for success and it's all relative for sure because we're on the call we might have many years that are working with adults well it's all relative again so how you reframe the questions i can't to i can and you can even get people that whatever you say so if it, you get polarity responders whatever you say it's always going to be if it's if it's one color it's the other color they'll always disagree with certain things so what we're going to do is work with that and know specifically what uh so i know it's impossible for you to do you know it's impossible for you to do i know it's impossible but what what would it be what do we need to do to get it from impossible so that you can do it so we're agreeing i know it's impossible but if you could do it when you can do it you're then shifting their beliefs somewhat then it's got to come through into that operational it's a physical feeling they can sense it and even if you hit it off your shin you score the one thing you did um, did with me there, Keith, uh, and maybe for David to come here, it's called the power of agreement, and you refer to this, mm -hmm. of course, in gold. So what you did there at the start of this, you asked you asked my permission, didn't you? What what's the benefit of doing that with the young players? Yeah, I think getting buy-in from people is important. So having them agree to what is going to take place. So my dad touched on it, and in the book we talk about yes sets, which really yes set it's just a sales technique it's a sales technique to get somebody to buy into what it is you're selling them now for us we're selling them something that is of benefit to help them so really all it is is you're getting people to agree with several statements that you make several things that you say in order to get them to agree with something else so uh, i'm gonna throw it back to you spence uh do you like coaching do you, do you enjoy coaching yeah, absolutely love coaching I me mean, I, I love coaching too i love it as a coach spence i'm guessing for you it's important to keep learning and developing absolutely yeah and look i'm the same so for you and you come on these type of webinars to learn something new i'm presuming yeah great now I don't know if you've heard of it. The Golders podcast <laughs> shares similar learnings to this webinar. So that would be beneficial for you too, wouldn't it, Spence? It certainly would, David. So so really, <laughs> all that is, is we're just, I'm just teeing it up. So I've yeah. said, right, okay, I'll get you to agree with four things that are true. So that I know that you like coaching. I know that you want to learn. I know that you go on webinars to pick up something new and then I'm going to throw something else at you. You've already agreed with everything else. So the chances are you're then going to buy in to, to the last statement. Um, now I'm going to, with that, I'm going to just jump back one step yeah. to the reframing. So I don't know, have you heard of Nims Perger? So Nims, Nims Perger is a, is a former Gurkha, um, then went into the, the SBS, Special Boat Service. He actually got asked, the only per he would have been the only person ever to be in the SBS and the SAS, because they wanted him to transition over. He then went on to do the 14 8,000 meter peaks. The previous world record for climbing them was seven and a half years. He did it in seven months. Wow. So in terms of reframing, and the only reason I bring this up is I've, I've read his book. Um, it, his book is, it's up there with the best I've ever read. And I've also heard him on a podcast. And, and in one of the podcasts, he said, if we always worry about the problem, there will be no solution. So for him, raising money is a problem. 
it could be a problem or there can be solutions to it. And really his ability to reframe things is as good as I've ever seen. And I would highly recommend for people on the podcast to, to read his book uh, because he, for me being aware of reframing while I was reading it, I was going, man, this is, this guy's incredible. He's, he's 8,000 meters up. He's in the death zone. He's got no oxygen and he's carrying people down. And there's, there's just been a, an avalanche. Now, for a lot of people, will go, this is it, done. And for him, that's not how he operated. He was able, he just reframed the situation. He might have his, his five seconds of, I'm in trouble here, to then, what can I do to make this situation better? What solutions do I have to make this work? So, sorry, I've jumped back there, Spence, but I wanted no, to, to throw that one out. Liam's still on the line. <laughs> Liam, is that good? <laughs> it's all there, Liam. Yeah, Liam. I'm listening, taking it in. Oh, good, 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 good stuff. Good stuff. Um, uh, no, thanks. Th th thanks, thanks, Liam. Good, great, great, thanks, Liam. great question. Thanks, Liam. Um, uh, yeah, really interesting point. You know, David, you know, my observations from, you know, working with a lot of young people, my, often the problem is not the problem as well. The problem is a referred problem and, and, so you know you I, I think this idea of reframing is really 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 powerful because if you take that the problem is not the problem it's only through reframing it that maybe we get to see what the actual problem is what, what's really going on um great stuff right let's move on i think spencer you've got you've got another question yeah i think we're, we're going on to the uh, the slide now aren't we so how many stems are there I'll give you 20 15 seconds how many stems are there from left to right, and from right to left. You get 11, counted 11, anybody? Yeah, Any? pop in the chat box. Yeah, How many yeah. we got? 13, 17, 23, 20. brilliant, 18, fantastic. Go on, any advances on 23? We got 18, 25, 33 from Ben Cochran. Okay. Now, how many of you actually seen the bird? Probably more than a shut off. <laughs> 24, <laughs> everybody's gone. How many has actually seen the bird? If you just have a look at the image now, and how many actually see the bird? Can I reveal the bird now, please? Yes, please. Yeah, if, if you, Again. If you, if, you, if you can. <laughs> you just press it again, please, right? There you go. There you go. So if you saw the bird, brilliant, if you've seen it before, if you didn't see the bird, it's what was pre-framed in advance of that? Because the question wasn't, can you find the bird? The question was, can you, how many stems were there? So in actual fact, what relevance does this have to my previous question, reframing? Equally, what relevance does it have to coaching? Well, quite a lot. When we actually look at quite a lot of things during the game, we actually see very little. When we actually go into focus, very foveal vision, when you start to focus on a specific part of the game, then more detail comes through. And that's pretty evident. So the ones who have all got the coaching qualifications when given a task and it's passing, but yet you start delivering defending, it's slightly different. And the, uh, the actual outcome might be different. So... When we move on to the next, the next part of this little webinar, uh, hopefully it'll become very apparent of where, where this shapes up with the first chapter of our book, which is around the lone wolf. Yeah, I think Thanks on that, Keith, it, it was, um, I mean, most certainly one of my favorite chapters, uh, the lone wolf and uh, you know what, what I think the audience would be really interested to find out is maybe the, the story behind it as well, because uh, I know we've spoke about it a few occasions uh, and it's a fascinating story. I mean, could you share, share a bit about The Lone Wolf and where it came from? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, without a shadow of a doubt. So The, the Lone Wolf, the, our book, uh, 
the first chapter of it, it it's basically the the core element of the book and it's it's quite a powerful one because it's something that it's real it's true it's it's something that i'd experienced and even though i thought the ball bib comb bib grass player is important of course it is but there are certain things that uh that i, that I missed and so this this young boy that i i work with never spoke so you might have players that you have you're working with that don't speak you might have players that never interact at all with the teammates you also might have some well that doesn't look you in the eye and this is what this young boy did he never looked me in the eye he never spoke or communicated to any of the players at all and over a period of time only because of the size of the group it, it really you went under the radar a little bit the only thing the only reason why we kept on was purely and simply it because of his athleticism and rather than looking short term we looked at it long term so we we took him on because of his mentality his attitude his 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 ability to just get the job done so a question that i pose to people uh, to everyone is when you have if you have, if you have someone like this do we aim to fix them and we want them to align to how, uh, how we want to be communicate, how we communicate, where I want you to look me in the eye and shake the hands and or, or to communicate. And he never spoke to any of the players. The only reason why we kept because of his actions, he could perform very raw, technically very, un, very untidy during any passing very untidy however when it came round to ball manipulation he was reasonably tidy lots of work to be done and you know if you're working in a program you'll always improve whatever technical work you're doing with players you will improve them on that technique you'll improve them it's 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 irrelevant it's definitely going to be taking place they will improve in the programs that you're working with so what did they do well i had to get to find out a little bit more so I uh, uh, contacted the parents and wanted to find out how many, I just wanted to find out whether he's being bullied, really. That was, I had to be absolutely brutally honest. Was he being bullied? What was suppressing him? Was there anything that I needed to know? And the only reason now I could do that without prying, without going behind the four walls, of which is very difficult nowadays because of child protection and, uh, and so forth, and, and all the, 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 the legality and the paperwork was I contacted and spoke to the parents. And it was a Christmas. I asked how Christmas was. I'd never spoke to the mum. I'd seen the pur, I'd seen his dad, but I'd never spoke to his mum. And his mum was a lovely, gregarious young, uh, uh, young woman. Uh, but I asked, and she openly said, she said, he's very quiet, isn't he? I said, yes, he is. And then I asked her, how many children do you have in the family? Is he the youngest? Uh, is he the eldest? He, there's five in the family. He was the youngest and he was a twin. His twin sister, as his mum mentioned to me, did all the talking for him in school. And that was a light bulb moment for me. So was it then a matter of me then spending time working with his sister Although I couldn't do that, that went through my head. But I, and I don't, I don't feel ashamed in sharing this. But I, I did have a moment. I got off the phone, uh, and it was quite emotional for me because, having spent a lot of time with players, working with players uh, of varying ages, that was one moment where I thought I, I've got to do some work here, and and that's what took place. So we. Uh, I spoke to him on the phone. We we had uh, he was on hands free, so I could speak to him, and his parents could hear what was taking place. And I asked him the question. I said, "How was Christmas?" And I'd, he'd never asked the question before ever. And he asked. He said, "Fine, thank." You. And he responded, "Fine, thank you." How was your Christmas? And I, I was taken back by that. Uh, so was this then a platform? to be able to communicate or get some form of connection with him, a different form of communication where we're on the phone, 
via uh, obviously whether it's hands free and parents can hear and all that. Because when in front of us, when directly in front or in presence of us, he doesn't look you in the eye. It, it was against the culture, which is fine. I understand that. I understand it more now. Uh, and he's still he's still quiet. However, the lights have switched on and significant differences and benefit. But the follow on our succession plan as a consequence to that has been where there's more support around players of a similar ilk. So it changed the way I looked at things. And like I said earlier, when I change what you think about, what you think about changes. So therefore, how we then go about doing what we do uh, has changed significantly for me based upon that one experience and one experience alone. And, and I, I implore everyone that's listening, you may have someone very similar. My, my thoughts and experiences around it doesn't necessarily mean it'll work for you on using these same techniques or, or strategies, should I say. But what I also did, is I asked him to write. So rather than him share phonetics or share words, can he write or equally, if they can't do that, because that was a punt, and unfortunately he could write around an experience that he'd encountered and uh, write your experience down. So he's, he's sharing information is, can you draw it? Could he have driven, could he draw it? And I'm sure he can. Fortunately, he could write and write very, very, uh, very capable at writing, uh, 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 I must say. However, uh, the overall experience has changed my life. I, I can't, I can't express or articulate how much that young boy has covertly or through, what I call the hidden school. He's taught me, he actually taught me like I mentioned, my dog Jack, did he covertly or overtly teach me how to how to reevaluate my life, how to reevaluate the way I go, go about doing my job, go about teaching or coaching or mentoring or facilitating or transferring, taking players from one place and taking them somewhere else that I thought was best for them. In actual fact, didn't need fixing, doesn't need fixing. All he really required was time and attention. And to to be in silence with him, he's comfortable with, and that was good enough for me. Yeah, that's fantastic, Keith. Great stuff. Great stuff. Um, uh, we are running out of time, but I am very keen just to get a couple of quick questions in that people have um, have sent in. So I'll I'll do that now. Um, uh, Liam asks to both Keith and David, what's the biggest challenge you've faced as a as a coach? So David, I'll come to you first. What's the biggest challenge is is it is it mad american parents running around with flags <laughs> it absolutely is ryan you <laughs> nailed it I don't, I don't even need to answer that one now you've done it um yeah no de dealing in america um dealing with parents yep. is the biggest challenge but also the greatest lesson to take forward with me mm. You, you, you know, I, I, I jest about the American parents there. The, the American parents that, that I have met and had the privilege of speak, speaking to, like I think you mentioned before, they've got an unbelievable desire to see their, their kids to, to do well. And, and I spoke about it before, you know, just having a passion for their kids to do well. I think that comes through so much. Oh, of course. And, and I will say, Ryan, I've been fortunate since I've been here. I've met some unbelievable people yeah. in America. Yeah. Yeah. Parents, um, just just i've met some amazing people you also get the uh, you also get the ones where that it so i've had some that have been the biggest challenge but yeah like everywhere you go there are great people and I, and i will say that i've met some great people and i'm sure i'll continue to do on the journey good good stuff keith your biggest challenge as a coach learning to be more flexible yeah learning to be more flexible readjusting and adapting to the, what I be, believe to be different different kids and different culture. Mm. So flexibility, learning to adapt and adjust and adapt quickly to meet what is required for the, for the moment has been a real challenge. I say biggest challenge. It still continues to be, yeah. but that's fine. 
I think yeah. my curiosity allows me the, the flexibility, the, the opportunity to do that because that curiosity keeps me alive. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been doing it for just under four decades. Yeah, <laughs> no, I think you're absolutely spot on. It's something we speak about a lot, isn't it, Spencer? You know, the, the teaching environment changes over the years as, as, as well, and you've got to, you've got to adapt with it. Um, the uh, time society has changed, and, uh, you know, we have to adapt all the time, don't we? We've seen that the last 12 months, how I've had to adapt across the world. Absolutely. Um, by the way. Um, uh, uh, li 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 Lyndon asks a question. What's the best podcast you've done so far and why? This one. Well, that, that's why I said podcast and not webinar. <laughs> you know, I want to give, yeah. give the other guys a, ch a, ch a chance. You've obviously done some other uh, interesting podcasts. Which, which, you know, which, ones have, which ones have stood out? A um, few for me. I would say... Damien Hughes's when we had him on yep. was was definitely one of them. Uh, James Roby and Justin Holbrook being a, a St. Helens fan hmm. were were definitely up there and, and also because of the quality. I think we've been really fortunate to have some great people on. Uh, we've got one coming out this Friday that was also up there with the best. So you're gonna. Oh. People, that's that's for people to to subscribe. They'll know who it is when when it gets announced on Wednesday. But this Friday's is is certainly certainly up there for one of my favourites as well. Great, great stuff. And that's a nice sort of little cue into me sharing some details. But whilst that's on, um, uh, Keith, um, you know, many people that are on the call uh, tonight um, will have read the book. I after so I'm actually in, I'm looking forward to reading the book again. Now I understand a bit deeper about where you guys are coming from. Um, but um, one thing, one question I did want to ask you was about who the book was dedicated to, why it was dedicated to this person and, you know, and, and, and the impact that, that, that he had on you. Yeah. So the book's dedicated to Dick Burt. Uh, Dick Burt is without doubt, one of the, one of the best coach educators in the world in the world he was renowned throughout the world and uh, unfortunately uh, uh, Dick passed of a, a brain tumor uh, just on uh, a couple of years ago in actual fact so what we've done is we've dedicated the book to Dick Bert. Uh 10 percent of all the of the profit from the proceeds of the book go to the Giles Trust Brain Tumor Fund which uh, obviously a worthy cause, but uh, Dick, for those that actually may have known him, he, when he actually, whenever he delivered anything, no matter whether you were pro license, a level one, or whether you're just involved in grassroots at whatever level, you could not, not come away with information that would be breathtaking. His technical knowledge and understanding of the game was as good if not better than anyone that I have ever come across in coach education. So the book's dedicated to Dick Burton, as I say, 10% of the profits go to the Giles Trust Brain Tumor Fund. Fantastic. Thank you for asking that question, by the way. Ron. No, 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 you're welcome. And, you know, uh, Dick is such a massive um, uh, loss to our game. And, you know, there were some real sort of titans of coach education around Dick's, um, uh, uh, you know, timeline. There's Dick, there's John Cartwright. John Peacock, um, you know, people like like that, and you know, Dick was not not lost with, within those other guys. Absolutely, you know, phenomenal. And you know, it's into, like you say, you know, I've been fortunate enough to spend time in different parts of the world. You know, I'm sure like David does as well, and he's known was known all all over all over the the the, the, the world and. Um, you know, I think that's a great cause that you guys have, have gone towards. So, um, so as you can see there, guys, um, all the information in terms of how to get the book on the website, obviously the, the individual Twitter uh, handles of the guys and obviously the podcast um, as, as well and uh, podcasts available, David, on all the um, on all the on all the big streaming services as that we can we can we can see um, there. Um, Guys, I want to say a massive thank you um, for your time uh, this evening. Um, I found it really, really, really interesting. And as I'm actually really looking forward to rereading the book um, uh, after tonight's conversation um, as well. So 
We really do appreciate that. Spencer, a few words from yourself. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've really enjoyed it. There's a lot to, to take out of tonight um, in terms of how we coach and building trust and care and, and so on with the players. But before we do go, um, you know, the, the Lone Wolf, which um, Keith kindly covered a little earlier, me probably my favourite chapter uh, of Gold Dust. And I think Lee's actually asked a question on here. Will there be another book, David? There will. Uh, this is actually... Uh, this is the first time we've ever spoken about the, the next project. So as we Which touched on the Lone Wolf, it is, this is exclusive. The, the Lone Wolf chapter was, was well received around the world and it, it led us to our next project, the next book. There are actually a couple in the works, um, but this is the one that'll be out first. And it's, it's called the, it, the, the book will be called the Lone Wolf. Um, and it'll likely be a story about assumptions, authenticity, and action. And it's going to be a short story book. Uh, it's going to delve into to messages that are important, really, in human life. And it's interesting because th there, is, there are a lot of similarities between wolves and humans. And we just really wanted to bring the lone wolf story into a fictional manner that would be easy to digest in all walks of life whether you're a parent a coach a teacher or an adult looking for for clarification in whatever it is you do and we felt the best way to go about it Spence was to tell a story um, human experience drives through story and it can be used as a powerful powerful method for learning so uh, here we are uh, uh, we've got a story to drive emotion as a method for learning um, so book number two will be out over the coming months. And, and as of right now, I think the title, The Lone Wolf, a story about assumptions, authenticity and action. And then when that one's done, there's another one working in the works as well, which will be around success. But we'll leave that for another webinar, another I think. One. Oh, yeah. fantastic. Well, I've got to say, it, it, I've really enjoyed it. You know, we, we've, had, we've had a few sort of technical based um, webinars and it's been really, really you know, refreshing and interesting to take a uh, you know a, a different perspective uh, to, to to the webinar tonight. So thank you, thank you again, uh, guys. Just to make everybody, uh, just to just to make everybody aware, uh, the next webinar in the Nefer Coaches Corners series is with Greg Broughton um, from Border Glimt in Norway. Now, for those of you that don't know uh, the Border Glimt story, Border Glimt is effectively an enlarged fishing village in the north north of Norway that have just won the Premier League in in Norway and Spencer they've not only they've not nicked it on the last day have they they have absolutely annihilated uh, the league and and it's a yeah. very special club and we're very lucky to have Greg on and we're looking to looking forward to understanding that club uh, in greater detail yeah i think there's a there's a lot of footage on youtube of but a glimpse and uh, you know take the time and watch them play absolutely unbelievable and like you say they have smashed the premier division set broke all manner of records uh, and really upset uh, norwegian football so you know greg's worked at a variety of different clubs um at norwich city which has got a great reputation for developing young players as well he spent some time there before heading off to Norway a few years ago. So again, it's going to be another fantastic coach's corner uh, with a top guest. So we will we will share we will share the details um, uh, of that with everybody in the coming days. So look out for that um, in your in your inboxes, and hopefully you can uh, join us um, on that next month. Um, yeah, one final time, thank you uh, very much uh, to, to Keith and David uh, again. Um, hope everybody uh, has a great rest of their week and we look forward to seeing you very soon again. So thank you, Keith and David, and we'll see you very soon. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, thank Ryan. You. Thanks see to you everyone guys. for, uh, for tuning care. in. Thanks, Take everyone. Care.